All right, well, let's uh, look at the next section in uh, Luke's gospel. We're looking at Luke chapter 7, and tonight we're looking at verses 24 through 30. And uh, the verses 29 and 30, I'm not going to deal with too, um, uh, too much because it's almost like, a, um, it's almost like a, a hinge that hinges what we're looking at tonight with what comes after it, so I'll just make some reference to it. But what we want to focus on mainly tonight is the tribute that Jesus gives to uh, John the Baptist to, to understand why it is that, that John was so highly esteemed in the eyes of the Lord, but also to understand how we might also uh, be uh, considered uh, great or greater or even greatest, although we're not going to be the greatest, but uh, greater in the kingdom of heaven uh, than we, we are. So let's, uh, let's read the, um, the text, beginning in verse 24. When the messengers of John had left, he began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who are splendidly clothed and live in luxury are found in royal palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and one who is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. I say to you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. When all the people and the tax collectors heard this, they acknowledged God's justice, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. Well, may the Lord bless his word again to our understanding and, and our growth in grace uh, this evening. Now, remember this morning we saw John sending messengers to Jesus uh, to ask whether he was the Messiah. Uh, during his ministry, John was fully convinced he knew the Messiah was coming. He knew he was the one who was sent out to basically prepare the way for him. He knew uh, from the spirits descending upon Jesus and remaining on him that he was the Messiah because that's what the Father said he could expect to see. And this is the one, he said, who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. He is the Messiah. Uh, John told his disciples uh, when he pointed Jesus out that he's the one they must follow because he must increase while John said he must decrease. But now John is having doubts. And we noted that even the greatest among God's servants will have struggles in this life. He was either worn down because of the harsh conditions of Herod's prison, which I'm sure was, uh, again, no, uh, no luxury condo, or because, like the Jews, he had different expectations of Jesus that he didn't see coming to pass. Well, the thing we wanted to note this morning was that uh, our Lord, in His mercy, sent messengers back to John, not with the bare claim that He was the Messiah, but with the things that John needed to hear, okay, with the evidence that He was who John thought He was, the Messiah. Along with this message, blessed is He who does not take offense at me. John, if you want to be happy, embrace what it is. Uh, your, your messengers are telling you what these witnesses are, are saying, what, what they have seen and what they have heard. Know that I am the Messiah. Trust in me and you will be happy. Now this evening, we see Jesus go further and pay tribute to this faithful servant, John the Baptist, as well as to go on to tell us who is the greatest in uh, the Lord's kingdom. Now, first of all, we see Jesus' tribute to John. Okay? After John's messengers left to take Jesus' word back to him, Jesus then turns to the crowds, not to criticize John uh, for his doubts, but to, to honor him. And again, let's just remember here that Jesus is showing his compassion. Jesus is showing his mercy. Jesus knows that John uh, is but a man. And he knows that we are as well. We're just human beings. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our frailties. He knows there's going to be times when our strength 
fails, when we're not able to, as it were, uh, find that strength that we need in the Lord Jesus to do the right thing. But of course, knowing our hearts and that we desire to serve Him, He's not going to reproach us, but rather He will strengthen us. And through the Lord's strengthening of John, John would go on uh, to really to be faithful to death. Uh, remember, if, as we see further, perhaps not in this gospel, but certainly in the gospel of Matthew, John will continue to minister to Herod, continue to call him out for his sins, and he will eventually die uh, for his, his message, for his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and would receive the crown of life, not because John is such a great man, but because the Lord is gracious and he sustained John through this entire time. So the question we want to ask this evening here is, um, how does Jesus honor John? Well, he begins, first of all, by addressing what appear to be the misunderstandings that people had, maybe the, the epithets they were sort of hurtling at John because they despised him. First of all, he asked the crowd, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? Remember, John the Baptist was ministering out in the wilderness. Who do you think this man was? who was out there ministering for six months in the wilderness of the Jordan, preaching, about, you know, the, well, preaching repentance and, and ministering the baptism of repentance. Who do you think he was? Was he, first of all, a reed shaken by the wind? Uh, it's interesting that, you know, we, on, on Wednesdays, you know, we've been going through um, uh, how to study the scriptures. And R.C. Sproul has basically just broken into the topic of literary forms, you know. How do we interpret the literary forms that we find in the scriptures? Well, here we see Jesus using one of those that we've already uh, dealt with. It's, it's called a, a metaphor. He's using uh, two really unrelated things. He's comparing them, although in this case it's a negative comparison, uh, that is not reflecting what Jesus thinks, but rather what the people think. The image of a reed or basically dried grass that's blowing in the wind to describe what perhaps some thought of John uh, as a wavering and unstable man in his life and in his message. So Jesus is asking, is this what you thought of John? Is this what you went out to see, somebody who basically couldn't stand on his own two feet, somebody who perhaps was a bit unstable and crazy? Well, Jesus implies that if that's how they viewed him, they were, of course, very wrong. Secondly, he said, did you go out to see a man dressed in soft clothing, basically a delicate man in luxurious attire, uh, like those who live in palaces? Uh, the word actually implies, as a matter of fact, it is a word that is used to refer to a man who is effeminate. Did you go out there to see this English dandy, as it were, you know, or this person dressed in ruffles or or somebody who is just really embellished. Is that what you went out to see? Is that what you thought of John? And again, this is likely another rumor that was spreading about John because they despised him. Well, if that's what they thought, they were even further off here. John, above, above really everyone else, lived a very Spartan life. Uh, there was nothing delicate uh, about the man. Uh, Matthew writes regarding John in Matthew 3, verse 4, now, John himself had a garment of, ha of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Uh, the clothing he wore was literally made from the hair of a camel. A.T. Robertson, who is um, a Greek scholar of the last uh, century, probably wrote the largest Greek grammar ever written, tells us that um, this camel's hair was essentially woven into a rough kind of sackcloth which doesn't sound very luxurious, doesn't sound very delicate, doesn't sound very comfortable. And he wore a leather belt around his waist. You know, one thing we need to see about that particular image is that this is how Elijah is described in the Old Testament, in 2 Kings 1.8, uh, as a hairy man with a leather girdle bound about his loins, and when you go a little bit deeper into the language, it doesn't necessarily mean that Elijah was somebody who just had a lot of body hair, but rather he was one who wore a garment made out of hair, which was essentially the garment of a, of a prophet. Plummer, the biblical commentator, writes that John consciously took Elijah as a model. 
And why do you suppose that he would have looked to Elijah for that particular uh, image or, or uh, someone to follow? Well, it's because I think of what uh, the angel said to Zacharias about John when he announced his birth in Luke 1, verse 17. Uh, the angel said, it is he, John, who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Well, we know that John the Baptist not only looked, you know, as far as his clothing like Elijah, but we know he also preached in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Now, another thing that was true about Elijah and his very Spartan kind of life is that the food he was eating uh, isn't the kind you would find in, in a palace. Uh, Matthew tells us that he ate locusts. Some would tell us that these are the fruit or of the ba basically the locust bean tree, but the word literally means he was eating grasshoppers. And um, he also ate wild honey, which means not a cultivated honey by people who were keeping bees to produce honey, and, and they did do that in those days. But it was the kind of honey you would find if you happened to, upon a, a wild beehive, you know, that's basically in the wilderness. Um, I suppose enough sugar, you know, can make just about anything palatable. Maybe if you put enough honey on those grasshoppers, they don't taste so bad. But anyway, that, that was the diet that, that this man was eating. Well, again, the question is, if, if it wasn't an unstable man, if it wasn't a delicate man that you went out to see, what did you go out to see? A prophet? Jesus says, yes, I say to you, and one who is more than a prophet. Now, again, we've already noted that John ministered in the spirit and power of Elijah. Again, one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. But how is it that he was more than a prophet? Well, Jesus goes on to tell us it was because of his work, the work that he was assigned to do, the honor that was given to him. He was going to be the one who would herald the coming of the Messiah. Jesus says in John, or excuse me, Luke 7, verse 27, this is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Now, Think about this. Think about the importance uh, in, in God's plan, that the importance of this work that John had. I think it becomes clearer when we understand exactly who this one is, uh, who Messiah is, uh, whose way that he's heralding. And by the way, you know, let's tune in here because this is um, a, a good passage to go to if you happen to run into some Jehovah's Witnesses that deny the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because in the book of Malachi, the one that the messenger is, is preparing the way for is none other than the Lord himself. Listen to what Malachi says in Malachi 3, verse 1. Uh, this is actually the Lord speaking through Malachi. Behold, behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming. And who is it that's speaking? Says the Lord of hosts. You see, John the Baptist was sent uh, to, well, the reason why he's more than a prophet is because he was sent to herald the coming of the one who is the covenant Lord of Israel, essentially Yahweh. And we understand that our Lord Jesus Christ is the second person of the triune God. This God, his covenant name for Israel is Yahweh. Yahweh is triune. And the Son of God becomes a man, and he is the one that John has been sent out to announce his coming. That's what makes him more than a prophet. Jesus then closes with this statement about John, and I think, again, conferring upon him perhaps the greatest honor that uh, anyone could receive I say to you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. And of course, that would mean the Lord Jesus accepted. Of course, he didn't come into the world the usual way. did have a human mother, but his father is, uh, again, God, the Holy Spirit, who conceived Jesus in the womb of the virgin. Now, notice, Jesus is not saying he's the greatest, okay? There may be others who were his equal. There are none greater than John. Moses, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah, these are all also great 
prophets, great men. But there was none greater than John, you see. So he's among the greatest in the kingdom of God. And I think that's very high praise coming from our Lord. And let's not forget, John just sent him two messengers saying, are you the expected one, right? Well, this is how Jesus is responding to him. John may be lapsing. He may be weak. I've sent his messengers to strengthen him. But let me tell you what John is really like, okay? There is none greater than John. But then Jesus goes on to say something that almost seems contradictory to what he just said in the remainder, I believe, of that, um, of that verse. He says, yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he, that is greater than John. Now, the question we need to ask here, because this is how I often hear this interpreted, and maybe you've heard it interpreted this way also in different churches, is Jesus saying here, that as great as John is, you know, there's none greater than John, that anyone who trusts in the Lord Jesus and enters into his kingdom, even the smallest and most insignificant believer, even those who on the last day when their works are judged by the Lord will be entirely burned up because they wasted their lives doing things that really had no lasting value. And the Lord tells us that there will be some who are there that are like that. They'll still be saved because of the foundation, but their works will be burned up. Is Jesus saying that that person is greater than John the Baptist because he trusted in Jesus? And does Jesus also mean by this that such believers that, that basically didn't give their lives to serve the Lord are greater than the patriarchs, than Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, greater than the kings, and I, I think particularly, uh, we, we probably just have in mind here David, and all the Old Testament prophets combined, are we greater than, than they? Well, I don't think Jesus can be saying that. Uh, for one thing, the patriarchs, the kings of Israel, at least those that believed, the kings of Judah, let me put it that way, and the, um, the prophets are as much a part of the kingdom of God as we are. And all the, all the New Testament saints, it's not like they're outside the kingdom and we're in the kingdom as though John the Baptist wasn't in the kingdom because we have all trusted the same Savior and we're all a part of the same body. We are all one in Christ uh, through Jesus, through the blood of his cross. He's broken down that wall that divided us and he's made us all into one new man. And that includes everybody who lived before Jesus who trusted him and everybody who will live after Jesus who trusts him. And I think that kind of a view also wouldn't agree with what the Lord says with regard to what we can expect for serving Him, you know, rewards. He tells us that the more that we do for Him, the greater our reward is going to be. And that, again, it's not, we're not earning those rewards, remember, those are rewards of grace, but the more we do for the Lord, the more we will be rewarded. And again, I made reference to this before, but let me just read in what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 14 and 15. He says, if any man's work which he has built on it, and he's talking about the foundation, there's no other foundation but the Lord Jesus Christ, and every man needs to be careful how they're building on it. Everyone needs to be careful because we're all building some kind of a structure that is going to be judged by the Lord on that final day. If any man's work which he has built on it remains he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Because again, it's not what we do that saves us, but it's Jesus who saves us. And if we have that foundation, we have everything we need to enter into heaven, but there are rewards. And there are the loss of rewards, depending on what we do in this world. Those who do nothing for God's glory, will not be as honored, will, will not be honored as much as those who have labored, those who have suffered, those who have given their lives for God's glory and for his kingdom. So what is Jesus actually saying here? Well, I think he's simply telling us what he's going to say later to his disciples and what we read uh, earlier in our meditation in Matthew 20. Verses 26 to 28, listen to what Jesus says. Whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve 
and to give his life a ransom for many. When Jesus says in verse 28 of our text, he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he, what he means is this, the one who humbles himself more, the one who serves him better than John is greater than John. Now, I think we'd all have to admit that John is really a hard act to follow, isn't he? I mean, he served the Lord quite well. He was the Lord's herald. He lived under very difficult circumstances. I mean, from the time he, he grew up to the point where he could be on his own, he went out into the wilderness to prepare himself for the work that he would do for the Lord. While he was out there, he fearlessly preached in the, uh, the power of Elijah, drawing out crowds and also the hatred of the leaders of Israel. And in his preaching, he also drew out the, the, uh, the hatred of Herod uh, by rebuking him, as we've already seen, uh, perhaps this morning, for um, uh, rebuking him for the fact that he had his brother's wife. And John would be martyred for this. So John is a very hard act to follow, but if we can do better than he, then we will be greater than he. Now, I do think that Jesus, when he said this, may actually have had himself in mind when he said what he said, because this is the way Jesus became the greatest also in the kingdom. Now, again, not as God. As God, he's the greatest of all, but as man, as the mediator. This is the path he took in order to be exalted to this place of greatest honor and authority in the kingdom of heaven. No one has ever humbled himself and served more than Jesus. Again, remember the, the hymn we sang at the beginning. He's the one who came into Jerusalem to humble himself, to become a curse for us on the cross in order that he might save us. And that's why Paul also points to Jesus as the example that we are to follow. In Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11, and here we see the whole thing summarized. He writes this, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God, note the word equality, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of bondservants and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We know that Jesus Christ uh, has, well, as he said to his disciples before he ascended into heaven, when he gave them the, the Great Commission, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore. Why was this authority given to him? It, it was because of his willingness to humble himself as he did and to serve us even to the point of death in order to bring us to God. Now, there's no way that we're ever going to be able to compete with what Jesus did. He is the greatest in the kingdom, and he will always remain the greatest in the kingdom. But that doesn't mean that we can't compete with John or with Abraham or Moses or Paul or Luther, or Calvin or Whitfield or Spurgeon or, of course, Jonathan Edwards, because these were all men, okay, like us. They have the same passions, the same nature as us, same struggles that we had. And yet, by God's grace, they, they serve the Lord. They were used powerfully in God's kingdom. Um, they, we can be like that, you know, by God's grace. Now, let me just mention, this is the only competition that the Lord actually allows in his church. Remember when the disciples were debating with one another who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? That's not what the Lord wants us to debate. He doesn't want us to see who can be better than the other and who can be greater and who can get more people to serve them. Uh, the competition that Jesus wants to see between us, the race he wants, is not a race to the top, but a race to the bottom. If you want to be great, you need to become the servant of all. If you want to be first in the kingdom, you need to be the, the slave of all. We are to try to outdo one another in showing honor to one another. 
by serving the Lord and serving each other. If we can do better than John, if we can surpass his service, we will have greater honor than John. We will be greater than him. So that's the point, I think, that Jesus is making here. He is honoring John for his service. And he says, if you want honor, then you need to try to outdo him. Now, Luke tells us that those who had been baptized by John, uh, those who received basically John's message and understood that who Jesus was, when they heard what Jesus said, they recognized that this was just, okay? This was basically God's justice. They acknowledged that. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected what Jesus had to say because, well, they rejected John's baptism. They rejected the message of humility. They rejected the message of repentance. They just wanted to be rich. They wanted people to admire them. They wanted people to serve them. They wanted to be on top. So they rejected Jesus. Well, may the Lord give us the grace to see the difference, right? And to see what it is that our Lord wants us to do. And may he give us the grace to be able to serve rather than to be served and to compete with one another in this area. And may the best servant win. <laughs> well, let's, um, let's bow in a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's, let's ask the Lord to help us to do just that.